So yeah, let's get into it with Schindler's List. So this is one I'd only seen once before. Same. Several years. I mean, probably probably in the 90s, honestly. I don't think I'd seen this movie since the 90s. You probably saw it a little more recently than that, obviously, since you probably didn't watch it when you were six. But <laughs> Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't remember much about it at all, honestly. Like, I just, and you know, it's a tough watch. It's, you know, it was a good movie. It's not something that, it's, I hate to say it's not rewatchable. It's just, it's tough. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's not that it's not rewatchable. It's just something you don't want to revisit. Yeah. It's, it's, it's emotionally taxing and depressing as good as the movie it is and is as important of a movie as it is. And like three and a half hours of just the most depressing stuff you're going to see. Yes. So obviously watching it with a little more eye on the on the history stuff and we're in the middle of World War II here of course. This movie's going to cover quite a few years of the war cuz it actually does go to the end of the war and then we're going to backtrack as we go through the next few weeks and look at the war more from other points of view, but this movie does kind of go all the way from the Germans invading Poland through the end of the war from the point of view of Oscar Schindler. And in doing the research, I was actually Oh, I hate to use the term pleasantly surprised when we're talking about Schindler's List, but uh, surprised at how accurate and true to real life it was. The biggest discrepancy I found was who actually wrote the list. And and in the movie, they kind of have it be specifically Schindler and Itzhak Stern, played by Bing Kingsley, going over the list and compiling it themselves. Whereas, uh, according to Wikipedia anyway, it says the list was actually compiled by... Uh, Goth, the uh, uh, Eamon Goth, the Ray Fiennes oh, character. Oh, really? And that that he helped compile the list uh, based on the reports they were getting. So basically, it's, basically it's like, hey, if we're going to let you use all these 1,200 Jews in your factory as you move it, we're going to uh, put the list together, I guess. I, it doesn't really go into context of it, but uh, even on, on Schindler's page himself, Oscar Schindler, it talks about that it was, uh, well, not, sorry, not Goth himself, but Goth's secretary compiled the list. Okay, I was going to say, because I, I thought I'd read somewhere, I, I forgot the name, but it was basically, yeah, they, in the movie they changed it because the, I guess the actual guy who was writing the list, he, he, not a good dude, and was um, he was actually like taking bribes from people to get on the list. Oh, interesting. Like basically, you know, telling people, hey, you know, if you want to get on this list and not go to Auschwitz, you know, you can pay me money. And then he was like uh, replacing people on the list, you know, that had paid mm. him so what I do think is the the genius of this story, but it also is, again, true to real life, it doesn't paint Oscar Schindler as a saint. Right. He's a flawed, flawed character who initially starts out with almost exclusively selfish interests, yep. who then over the course of the war slowly becomes more and more motivated by doing the right thing. And even almost until the end, he still is always using the economic interests as uh, at least a supposed motivator for helping to save these Jews. How they'll basically, I don't have to, I don't want to have to retrain anybody else. They already know how to do the work. Well, and at the beginning of the movie, it's that's pretty much entirely. He's like, wait a minute, I can get these this Jewish labor for super cheap. And he's even he even has that conversation with Ben Kingsley where he's Ben Kingsley's like, yeah, you know, like the. The Germans think that the uh, the poles are more, you know, they're more capable, so they they cost more. And he's right. Like, okay, so we don't hire any poles then. We we'll just only hire Jews, and you know, we don't have to pay them as much. Right. He's basically working with the right. Yeah. yeah com- completely, um, completely economically motivated, and it, almost by accident, he's like saving these people's lives because he's getting these, you know, people that are, um, you know, oh, I'm a I'm like a, a history professor, or I'm a musician, you know, people that are like for sure going to concentration camps. And uh, get some fake paper so they can come work in his factory for cheap. Right, and he actually, and actually gets mad at Isaac Stern for trying to push people who aren't as valuable to the actual production line and are just people who are friends he's trying to help out. He gets mad at him. He's like, that's, that's not what we're doing here. You're going to basically... Right. Now, again, he's mad. He doesn't say, I don't want to save these people. He says, you're going to get me right. in trouble. Yeah. Right, because he, wa- he wants to maintain that plausible deniability still. Yes. So when, when Stern brings him like... The, he's like, oh, you know, so and so wants to say thank you. It's a guy with one arm, right? And he's like, don't ever do that again, right? You now, yeah, you're exposing me for having known that I have a one arm employee that I can't actually say is super valuable, right? You know, or more valuable than someone with two arms, and oh, yeah. Anyway, so 
But yes, it's it's uh it's it's extremely accurate. So the main character we already kind of mentioned the three the three main characters in the movie are Oscar Schindler played by Liam Neeson, Isaac Stern played by Ben Kingsley, and Eamon Goth played by Ray Fiennes. And that's kind of what the whole movie revolves around. Which about. what a performance from Ray Fiennes! And this is like how many movies had he even done up to this point? Oh, that's a good. Yeah, you're right. I was surprised how young he looks. He's young. He's yeah. like thirty. He's like early thirties, I think. But at the same time, it's like it's. I mean, it's only about a decade before he played Voldemort. Yeah. But I guess. But I guess a lot of times passed since then already too, since he first played Voldemort in what the fourth Harry Potter movie. So he was born in sixty two, right? So he he didn't start acting then until his like what late twenties, early thirties. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So he would have been thirty one. But he well, I, I, again. Just because he's very proper British seeming fellow, I would imagine he was doing a lot of stage work and then got into film. I don't know that for sure, sure though. And then, but yeah, it was only his third movie. Now he did play Heathcliff, which is the male lead in Weathering, Weathering Heights in '92. Although it's a version I'm not super familiar with, but that is a that is a lead. Actually, his first movie he was a lead, so he had to have been established. Actually, and actually, he played. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia in a TV movie in 92 as well. Okay, the, on his Wikipedia page, it says he first achieved success on stage yeah. at the Royal National Yeah, I think, again, you're not getting leads in TV and movies right off the bat unless you have right. a, some serious yeah. chops coming into that. And then uh, I probably first saw him in Quiz Show, uh, which was uh, Best Picture nominee from 94. And then, of course, he's the lead in The English Patient in 96. Anyway, yeah, so yeah, Ray Fiennes is pretty cool and does a great job as a villain here. He won an Oscar this year, didn't he? Didn't he, didn't he get Best Supporting Actor, or was he just nominated for Schindler's List? Oh, yeah, actually, let's, yeah, let's, let's, pull, up, let's, let's pull up the Oscars for Schindler's List. So Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it won seven, but no right. acting. So Neeson and Fines were both okay. nominated, but did not nominated. win. So it won seven, nominated for another five. But yes, one director, picture, writing, cinematography, yeah, editing score, John Williams, of course. <laughs> Which I wonder, so... I mean, with Liam Neeson, I can kind of see it. You know, I mean, he, his performance is fine, like it, but it's it's he's not doing anything super crazy or outside it's the box. It's pretty under it's an understated. It's understated. But, I mean, it, yeah, right. But Ray Ray Fine's performance though is like yeah, capital E evil. Yes, it, but also very not very manic, except at certain times. Oh yeah, it's it's Tommy Lee Jones won Best Supporting Actor for The Fugitive. Oh my gosh, over yeah, I would agree. That should go to Fines for Good sure. God Almighty. Let's uh. Well, who else was up? Because I would definitely give it to Fines over uh, Leonardo DiCaprio for What's Eating Gilbert Grape, John Malkovich for In the Line of Fire, and I I I, I recognize this guy's face. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Oh, Postal Wait. Yeah, it's Pete Postal Yeah, Wait. yeah. Uh, and I might be off too, but I know it's something roughly like that. Uh, and sure. that that was solid too. In the name of the Father's uh, Daniel Day Lewis movie. Yeah, I would definitely give that to Fines though. So I've, yeah, I've seen all of those. I'd give it to Fines. Never been a Malkovich fan. Anyway. <laughs> And okay, is it Tom Hanks in Philadelphia for Best Actor? I can see, but Tommy Lee Jones in the in the Fugitive. I mean, it's the Fugitive is a good movie. I like Tommy Lee Jones in that movie, but it's not. It's just it's not a better. Right. It's kind of a. It's kind of a. It's, it's a. It's a fun role. It's a memor- memorable role. He does a great job in it, but it's not an Oscar winning performance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would. But again, yeah. honestly, honestly, sometimes, sometimes though too, it seems like in the male categories, even more in the female categories, like you need to be a little more established. Like a lot of times of. Well, I say that Christoph Wal- uh, Christoph Waltz won pretty early for uh, uh, Inglorious Bastards. Well, yeah. Speaking of people winning young Oscars, uh, <laughs> Anna Paquin won in '93. Well, that's what I was gonna say. And she was, she the... was like what, like eleven years old? Yeah, or something? no. But I'm saying I feel like you see it more on the female side for those for supporting actress specifically. It seems like they give it to like the new stars fairly often, whereas in all three other acting categories, you tend to be a little more established. But again, that's definitely not our. There's no hard and fast rule on any of that. But I think a lot of it is just to be in tiebreakers and I don't know, just trends. Yeah. It's not like they get to. Anytime people do complain about the Oscars, it's like they didn't sit in a room and decide these things. It's individuals voting, and that's how the vote turned out. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we've kind of we haven't really gotten into detail on the plot because you know, fucking you know, Casablanca, we had to kind of break down the nuances of the plot because it was more of a plot driven movie, whereas Schindler's right. List is more kind of a. It's the drama of the real life of the Holocaust. And a lot of it is right. just kind of showing the horrors of the Holocaust, showing, you know, a, a, a one thing that really kind of stuck out as an anecdote here we could talk about is there's the women in, they are in a concentration camp or, you know, kind of one of the forced labor camps near Krakow there. And they've heard rumors of, 
gas chambers and they don't believe it they convince themselves yeah. that there's no way that is true it makes no sense we're too valuable as workers why would they just kill us which is that's literally an argument a talking point that holocaust deniers use to this day oh is it that oh why would the nazis why would the nazis gas all the jews they were using them as labor it doesn't make any sense why would they do that oh my gosh it's at, and that's you know I mean, right. yeah. to to us, that seems crazy, but yeah. Right. And, yeah, I've never understood the nihilism. It's like, there were people, and then where were those people? Like, it's like, you just can't just pretend they never existed. Like, it's, oh my God. Anyway, we don't have to, we, I, let's not even go there. But, oh, yes. Yeah, it's... And then, so at the, end of the movie, <laughs> at the end of the movie, when the women are, they end up, it actually, it, was, it wasn't exactly a clerical error. Basically, the 1,200 Jews on Schindler's list. I know, it it was right. What didn't doesn't doesn't Schindler say it's well, paperwork error? In a sense, they basically assumed it was. So the people who made the decision to reroute the train assumed it was a mistake. So they didn't read the paperwork oh, okay. wrong. They said, "What? Go into oh, some right. so go into some factory? No, I'm sending them to Auschwitz." Like so, it was something like that within right. the movie gotcha. anyway. So all the men made it to Schindler's factory, but the women were rerouted to Auschwitz, where they then are very quickly put into a shower and it's playing out exactly how the gas chamber story had been described to them. And they're basically just had resigned themselves to death. They're all crying. And then the showers actually kick on, even though it was Auschwitz, right. they were just actually get, they was given a shower. Although actually that's something I did not find in the research that I, so I, that may have been an invention of the film too. I don't it, think it is. Yeah. And it's actually uh, supposedly it's, almost exactly like shot for shot a scene in another earlier movie about Auschwitz. Oh, and okay. apparently the director of that movie like wanted to sue Steven Spielberg oh, or really? over it. Yeah. I, I guess that's gets the old fine line between an homage and theft <laughs> or plagiarism. But right. yeah, so yeah, that does seem to be an invention. So there's kind of the two main factories that we're dealing with. So the whole movie it's in Krakow and the, you know, the Germans have moved in. They're putting everybody in concentration camps. But basically, Schindler starts, buys his factory. He's kind of extorting the Jews to get this factory in the sense that he's getting a good deal, but you can't own it anyway, so why not just let me own it a name, but then you guys can still run it for me, and I won't do anything other than be the PR guy. And Ishtok Stern is kind of like, well, that's, that's a, kind of a crappy deal. He's like, yeah. yep, this is the world you live in now, so take it or leave it. And they basically are allowed to then even... The people who work in Schindler's factory are allowed extra privileges because they actually get to leave the concentration camp. Or sorry, not the concentration camp. They're actually in the ghetto at this time. Right. So which which is separate. So basically they had quarantined a per- certain part of Krakow and just, you know, just kind of fenced off, you know, secured off. And all the Jews live in there. But they're allowed to leave to go work in the factory. It's then later from there that they uh, are taken to the concentration camp during the quote unquote liquidation of the Krakow ghetto, which again, I just, oh, that, that word itself just makes me cringe. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily murder them all, but it is cleaning out the ghetto to move them to the concentration camp. So the deadline for edu- entering the ghetto was 1941. And yes, March, uh, March 13th, 1943 was the quote, liquidation of the Krakow ghetto. And basically, they just moved them to a concentration camp in, in near the suburbs of Krakow. And it's also a forced labor camp there. And again, this is kind of part of Schindler's then constant dealing with keeping his people safe and working at his factory. And you're you're making it hard on me if it's going to hurt the war effort if I have to close these factory and retrain people. So keep my people around, please. And then as the war effort then shifts and the Germans are kind of like, okay, things aren't going well. We need to kind of like start closing up some of these camps. Everybody starts getting sent to Auschwitz. And that's when Schindler's factory near Krakow is going to be forced to close. And he's like, oh, well, I'm going to open a munitions factory then to help the war effort. And I'm going to do it back. And I don't I think they actually say Czechoslovakia in the film. They say it's in Schindler's hometown, which again is in Czechoslovakia, like we talked about last week, was also Nazi-controlled, and he's opening a new factory, a munitions factory, and here's where the list comes into a play. So he's always kind of been helping his workers get special privileges and not get killed by the Nazis whenever he can, but now this is this is where it becomes a big deal. Before, it was all just kind of the local people at the local factory, and he's just kind of schmoozing and bribing Nazis to keep things nice for his business. Here's where it kind of escalates to... No, this is an actual list. These people are, my factory's closed. This concentration camp is closed. They're moving everybody to Auschwitz. They're probably going to all be killed. I'm going to basically invent 
a whole new factory, say it's a munitions factory, and I'm going to specifically hire, or actually basically buy as many Jews as I can from this Eamon Goth guy under the guise of it helping the German war effort and that these are specifically skilled people that I need for the German war effort. And we're going to move them all via train to Czechoslovakia for my new factory. And then once that new factory is open, I'm going to make for darn sure it never actually produces a mortar shell or anything that can help the Germans in the war effort. And I'm just going to fake it until the war ends and he does it. They got through and, you know, they were able to come up with 1,200 names. And again, this is both in the movie and in real life. Schindler went bankrupt, just spent everything he had and all his financial resources so to get these the Jews over to his factory that were on his list and save them. And then a year later, the war ends. And those 1,200 people owe their life to Oscar Schindler buying and bribing and, you know, their way out. And and even once they were in Czechoslovakia, it wasn't even that simple, too. He had to continue to bribe and bribe and bribe and, and buy gifts from the black market and just for all these German officials to keep his workers safe while they weren't actually producing anything. And then basically he just ran off the clock on the war. And like we see in the movie, he kind of lets his his workforce know, you're now free, I'm now wanted, because I am a member of the Nazi party. So right. Sh- Oscar Schindler did join the Nazi party before the war. And because on, on paper, I literally have, you know, bought Jews. Oh, yes, I'm basically a human trafficker before the term was in, was in vogue or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So then the movie then just kind of cuts to the actual gravesite of Oscar Schindler. And obviously, of course, this is, this, you know, one of the most iconic scenes at the end of any movie is this procession of Jews going and putting the stones on Oscar Schindler's actual tomb, which is in Jerusalem. He's the only Nazi buried in Jerusalem. <laughs> That's for darn sure. Yeah. So this was in 93, though. So a lot more of them were actually alive. So it has the actual survivors of the, of the actual Schindler Jews. Like, so they're called the Schindler Jews. So I, I don't want to say survivors of the Holocaust because there are there were more survivors of the Holocaust other than the Schindler Jews. But uh, right. actual Schindler Jews going through, placing rocks, and then w- escorting them as they go are the actors who played them in the movie, which is kind of a neat touch that I think I missed the first time that that's what was happening. I thought all the younger people were just like, oh, that must be their family that's with them. It's like, oh, no, that's that's the actor. That's the actor who played them in the movie. Yeah, and that, that was something that I would not have noticed had I not been watching the movie on Amazon. And it shows, you know, they have the little, like, trivia stuff that pops up on the side. Oh, okay. And that was one of them is that, you know, oh, all these people are being, you know, they're being accompanied by the actors who played them. So I don't know if I would have noticed it myself. But, you know, there was I was like, oh, hey, you know, that's like the, that was like the little girl. Yes. You know, Danka. And that's, you know, oh, that's, uh, you know, so-and-so. But, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Isak Stern was or had died, I think, in the sixties. Uh-huh. Yeah. Schindler died in the in the seventies. But oh, because because the side note there is, they said that like Schindler like wept unconsolably at Isak Stern's funeral, which really? I'm like tearing up even just thinking about that. And yeah. so, but walking with Isak Stern's widow is being Kingsley, since I don't think she was necessarily even in the oh, in that's the right. film. Yeah, yeah, and. Yeah. Anyway, yes, su- super, super powerful film, surprisingly and depressingly accurate. Eamon Goth, we do see Ray Fiennes' character hanged after the war, and that is what happened. Yep. Anything else about the movie itself? I am going to go, I do want to talk a little bit about Eamon Goth and a little bit about uh, Schindler outside of before and after the events in the film. Anything about the film itself before we kind of get into that stuff? Oh, just we were talking about the Oscar nominations and wins. This is another win for uh, my boy, John Williams. Yes. Another John Williams score. This is actually his his most recent Oscar is Schindler's List. Not nomination, obviously, but that's his most recent win. No, he's. He's been nominated 20 times since 1993, but this is his most recent one. It's, and it's, it's, it's only his fifth one. <laughs> but John, John Williams is eternal. He's, he's never going to die. He's going to be making writing film scores long after we're both gone. So. <laughs> Man, I, 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 well, I say I hope you're right. But when the dude's At 87, I don't morning. want him to outlive me. <laughs> and, and this, yes, if he lives to be 300 and still making movie scores, great. But... I don't God, want I the 87-year-old so. to outlive me. <laughs> Ugh. I, only if it's John Williams. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yes. The, it is, yeah, after the apocalypse, you'll have the cockroaches and John Williams uh, setting the score for their, 
but yeah yeah so he's yeah he's yeah he's obviously still still working he'll we'll see his music here in the star wars movies coming up and yeah even other stuff too like he's the conductor coming up in something called some graham yeah some graham abraham film who i've never heard of and some movie i've never heard of but nope oh, john williams doing the score so yeah i hope to continue working well into my late 80s as well so schindler's list and then the movie that we just did casablanca they're both in the imdb top 250 yes casablanca is way down at number 48 for like no reason like yeah. avengers endgame is higher <laughs> well and again when now we've i've yeah, IMDb the top two fifty is basically broken at this point. And I and I've gone into detail about my theories on that on it's probably on the Trackners podcast, but no, it, it's just a flawed list. My my take on it basically is your theory was it basically got ruined in two thousand eight, right? Correct. When the Dark Knight came, and hey, and I and I don't know that Schindler's List was well behind or where it was compared to Casablanca at that time, but just generally well, Schindler's speaking, Schindler's List is at number six now. Which I, I can, you know, that that makes sense to me. That Schindler's List would right, be that that's high. Fine. I don't that's know why Casablanca right. is forty eight. At, at the end of the day, the movies on the list are pretty good. Yes. As far as the order, you know, whatever. As far as stuff not on there, whatever. But the movies on the list are good movies. But yes, the stuff like Endgame give me a break. That it's one of the yeah. top 250 movies of all time. And people will be like saying, well, 250 is a lot of movies. Like, yeah, there's a lot of good movies. And Endgame is fine. <laughs> it's not one of the greatest movies of all time. And it's certainly not better than Casablanca that we talked about last week. Yeah. Yeah. the It is kind of just the way that ratings and stuff works. It is kind of biased towards newer movies. Yes. Which is why you'll see, like, even if a movie is just, like, just a little bit good, it'll, like, rocket to the top of top 250 and then slowly over time will fall down the list and down and down sometimes they leave the list completely but and and like we mentioned with the oscars it, it's not like they got together and decided this is the list yeah, they have they've developed right. an algorithm that they thought would be a fair way to allow the users to themselves to develop a, a, a list through through ratings and it's flawed and, and that's fine and that's why you when you get like an afi list i think it's a stronger list in the sense that it was discussed, debated, and decided upon as opposed to just kind of open source voted on or right. al- some algorithm that's deciding based on stuff. On the AFI list, Casablanca is number three, and yeah. Schindler's List is number eight. So You know what? That Yes, and, and, and uh, that, that's probably worth going through. And they, they've done an update. I think I actually might have made it all the way through the initial AFI list. But they updated it. The I, one from from ninety seven. Yeah, they I, updated it oh seven. Yeah, I think maybe I've seen the o the ninety seven list, but I have not completed the oh seven list. Real quickly here, as we're as we're wrapping up, so Eamon a- Goth, Goth, the Ray Fiennes character, the, this guy was every bit the Nazi bastard you would imagine. This is a guy who was. He was an early adopter to Nazism. He joined the Nazi party before Hitler was even the German chancellor. Like he was, so you think about like when we were talking about cabaret and like the little background Nazis who were just kind of running around beating people up. Eamon Goeth was right there in with those guys. Like he was an early, early Nazi before they even took control and just kind of was, you know, definitely all about everything they were preaching and just kind of had various jobs for them over the years. He actually had to even uh, flee Germany when he was obtaining explosive for the Nazi parties. So again, just to tell you how early of a Nazi he was, he had to flee Germany for helping the Nazis because he was helping them get explosives and stuff illegally. And then he was uh, smuggling, you know, uh, radio equipment and weapons uh, into Austria for the SS, you know, once the Nazis had taken control. So just kind of had various odd jobs and, you know, set himself apart as someone who could be trusted and a leader within the party which then ultimately led him to be the administrator for the concentration camp we mentioned in the film. And again, I forget the exact name. It's the one near Krakow, but it had another German name. Uh, 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 Platzov? Yeah, Platzov or whatever. Yeah. So, yes, the concentration camp we see in the film was the one he was put in charge of, and he was kind of given, oh, not carte blanche, but he could basically do whatever he wanted. It was his camp, and he uh, was very proud of that and, told the the Jewish population when they got to his camp that I am your God and had no problem just killing them like they weren't even people. This guy had been a decade-long Nazi at this point and just a horrible, horrible person. A side note, I I saw a tweet recently where it was kind of talking about, you know, obviously not allowing for any apologetic Nazi 
stuff, which is which is definitely appropriate. If you were if you were a, a, a Nazi or basically someone who didn't speak out against the Nazis and you were a German who just kind of like wanted them to go away, but you didn't do anything to stop them, you were still a Nazi. But I think the, maybe the one exception, or at least you know, it's either the exception that proves a rule or it maybe does open the idea that it's a little more complicated than that is Oscar Schindler himself who was a Nazi, who was a Nazi pre-World War II, but is a hero to the Jews. And yeah. would not have been able to do anything that he did had he not been a Nazi and Correct. had he not gotten real chummy with the Nazi leadership. Correct. Correct. So it is complicated. And again, he may be the only exception, but there's at least one exception of a Nazi who wasn't completely horrible and didn't kill people and help save lots of Jews to the point that he's... Again, this isn't just sensationalized for the film. The dude is buried in Jerusalem. Well, before before we get off, go. Did you see this where it talks about in uh, in 1944 he was relieved of his command, not because of you know like the murders or anything, but just because he was stealing stuff from the Jews. Oh, I didn't not see because that. Because that that was bad, but because that's technically state property. Oh my like, gosh. That was what that's what the the nazis were like you know the hang-up was but then it was like it was so close to the end of the war that they just kind of like dropped the charges and he ended up getting he got caught anyway obviously and was hanged but back to schindler real quick basically the note i made for the real life schindler was that he was basically just a mover and a shaker he was just the guy who liked to be where the action was he liked to hobnob with important people he was always kind of a bit of an entrepreneur and kind of just did whatever odd job he kind of thought would you know work out for him for a while and and, and we see that in the movie kind of at the beginning where he kind of he kind of shows up to a bar alone and then starts buying drinks for all the nazis uh, like the officers and is immediately like you know the life of the party and you know kissing all the women and again a, a, a mover to shaker type so you kind of see he'd be the kind of guy who would like ooh you know, here's an opportunity to get this factory going and get cheap labor from the Jews and stuff. And then who kind of then uh, becomes uh, more noble as he, as he goes. So after the war, he was broke because he had spent all his resources, like we said, saving the Jews on his list, the, the 1200. So he, he tried, you know, other things to kind of get going afterwards. But ultimately, the rest of his life, it looks like he lived on the financial support of the Jews he had saved, which... Really, you know, in a way, sounds kind of sounds kind of like oh, not low class or or like sleazy. Like it sounds like that, I guess, on the surface. But I think again, they were literally only alive because he had sacrificed everything he had to save them. So I think they were more than happy then to provide him financial assistance so that he could now basically pay him back is what you're doing. Right. I'm not saying they owed him, but I'm saying. He needed the help, and they supplied it. I guess is the way to say it. Did he? Uh, did he like move to Israel and like when like after it was right after it was founded, or is he just buried there? That's what's crazy. Yes, he died in Germany and then was buried in Jerusalem. That's like how huh. honored he wow. was, or how in high regard he was held by Israel and the and the Jews. So, and just as just to his character, so in the movie, another kind of almost the theme of the movie is what a womanizer he is, and that's probably pretty accurate. This, so in the movie, they almost kind of make a joke out of it where his wife comes to visit him, and he's like, Hey, or she says, You know what? Hey, just let me stay, and we can uh, we can kind of get a restart on our marriage, and blah 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 blah. And he's basically like, Nah, you need to go back home so I can sleep with other women, <laughs> yeah. And but yeah, in, in real life, he had affairs and even had you know bastard kids but again that's kind of goes to the movie's credit of not not shying away from those things i always feel like if they would have made this movie in the 60s they would have just skipped all that oh yeah but you know get in the 90s you can be have a little more of a nuanced character where you can still be the hero but you know far far from perfect at the same time okay so yes thanks for listening to this week's episode and next week we'll stick with world war ii and we'll get to the downfall of adolf hitler in the german film downfall 